Hi everyone, I'm Christina from That Canadian Teacher. In today's video, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences with distance learning and go through some of the strategies that work for me. This video is going to be focusing solely on the teaching strategies and lesson ideas that I had during distance learning and not so much about government policy. <laughs> Now, prior to school closure, my class was a one-to-one -one blended environment. So the transition for the students was probably a little bit easier in terms of the lessons uh, that they were going to be receiving and their responses to that. And so these uh, activities will reflect that environment that I already had. This may not be the case for you and your situation. So please take that with a grain of salt and use what fits for you and take the strategies and adapt them to your circumstances and the circumstances of your students. So the first strategy is one that I saw Peacefield History on Instagram do. When Ontario went to school closure, we actually had a two week period where we were uh, not to do any instruction. In this two week period, what I did was I actually started paying attention to what American teachers were doing with their classes because a lot of American schools had actually continued through as they didn't ha have spring break at the same time that Ontario teachers had. And so I was paying particular attention to what was working for them and some of the challenges they had experienced. And Peacefield History had actually posted about a learning um, like module of some sort that was in Google Slides. And what she had done is she had put all of the lessons for the week uh, onto this Google Slideshow. Now for her, she was looking at it from a perspective of a American history and her actual curriculum. So this didn't actually apply to me who was teaching Canadian history at a grade 10 level. So what I did was I actually took that kind of principle of having all of my lessons on a Google slide. Prior to school closure, my students would actually go to my website and would obtain their daily work from my website. And that would be kind of our home base. Homework would have been posted onto our Google Calendar, and that's where they would have just checked in if they were away. I realized by looking at Peacefield History's experience that this was not going to be uh, working because what was going to have to happen is I was going to have to explain, okay, you're going to go to this page on my website, you're going to have to go to the calendar, and it was just too much in a situation where I couldn't have that conversation. So what I decided was to kind of throw the web page out and throw the um, the calendar out. Now I didn't literally delete them or anything, but I just decided to kind of move our programming to Google Slides. So what I did was I created a learn at home uh, slideshow using Google Slides. Now the reason why I chose Google Slides and not something like PowerPoint or some other platform is simply because um, my board has been actively using Google Apps for Education and my class has been using it and so it would have been just a trouble-free transition for my class. And so what I did was I um, populated the slideshow and I'll insert uh, some video of what it looked like. And I populated the website with strictly what they were supposed to be doing for that week and any links or anything that they would need to be aware of to help them be successful. Now, keep in mind that my students uh, largely did not have their textbooks. So I had to actually throw out any, any notion of using a textbook for homework. Now, uh, companies like Nelson Publishing actually provided digital versions of this, but this was not the textbook we were using in class, which was an Oxford publication. And so I just decided that it was probably going to be too much trouble uh, for the students and for me, quite frankly. And so I decided to use more web-based lessons. And uh, what you're going to see in this slideshow is all of the links to any of those things that we were gonna be using. So links to uh, Flipgrid, links to uh, the Nelson site. Uh, anything that I was expecting them to kind of uh, use throughout the course was going to be in this the first section of the slideshow. From there, every week I would update the slideshow. The link to the slideshow never changed. I just continuously populated with the next week's work. And so uh, for the first week, they would have their uh, three hours worth of work. So part of our ministry policy was that students were expected to do three hours of work per week. And this would have included a one hour uh, meet uh, that would have been expected to be what they termed as being synchronous. And so once a week, I did actually meet with my students through Google Meets. And, uh, and then the students would be given work to do that should amount in total to three hours of work a week. And so that's what I did. And I decided to divide it by 
um, three kind of sections of a table. So this would be like, this is worth one hour, this is worth two hours, this is worth three hours. That wasn't always the case, um, but it was kind of what I had in the back of my mind. So what I ended up doing is I put all of the links that they needed into this slideshow. And this was, a, this was a suggestion from Peacefield History, is that have everything in one location. Because if you start sending the students to six different locations, like if I was to send them to go to the calendar, then go to your website, then go to wherever, then they're just gonna get lost and they're not gonna know what to do and you're gonna be fielding all kinds of emails. And I just wanted to eliminate that kind of issue. So I put everything that they had to accomplish for the week into the learn at home slideshow. So they would immediately know that on Monday or Tuesday, whenever their class would happen, is they would immediately go to the slideshow, they would see what had to be done and I would itemize the things for them. Now, one of the things that I decided to implement was a strategy of should, can, if you want. Everything that I was expecting the students to do was in the should part. So this is the curriculum expectation. This is what I want you to accomplished by the end of this week. Uh, the can is things that would in help enhance the should. So if you're not quite sure about something or if there was learning skills that I wanted them to um, develop further, that would be in the can. So it would be kind of like, you know what, if you have a lot of work to do this week, don't worry so much about the can, but you should get the should done. The if you want was more suggestive. So I would put things like, uh, crash course videos. Um, I would put other resources into the, into the if you want section to allow for them to do further exploration. So if they didn't particularly understand, let's say the Cold War, they could um, watch other videos that I recommended that would help enhance their understanding of the Cold War. And so in dividing it this way, the students in their reflections at the end of the semester and end of the weeks, they actually were uh, had really positive things to say about the should, can, if you want system. They felt that it, it really um, isolated what they needed to accomplish and they didn't feel overwhelmed by the amount of work that was presented to them. So they knew that at the very least I need to accomplish should if I had more time or if I was bored or whatever the case might be is, or if parents wanted them to um, do more work, they knew they could do the can and the if you want. So it just kind of allowed them that flexibility. So that's something that definitely worked out well and the students had really positive things to say about it. The second thing that I, I decided to do was a fun challenge. This idea came to me from History from the Middle and she had posted on her Instagram about how she was using Zoom to have a, a daily or weekly con contest among her students. Now I believe that she was doing this as part of her daily check-ins with her students. I did this as a weekly contest. Um, so what I did was I decided to um, take a image of a location in Canada and I specifically wanted to choose something that was within the historical time period that we were looking at. So 1914 to the present. And I picked something that was specific to Canada. So I didn't want, you know, I could have just as easily used Juno Beach, which is in France. But I wanted to make sure that it was it was encouraging Canadian tourism because during this time of distance learning, we can't travel anywhere. And so it kind of gives them a sense of what's out within Canada that that we could potentially explore when this is all over. What are some of the tourist locations or locations in Canada where things of great historical significance had actually happened? And so what I did was I would just pick a picture that was specific to a location I had in mind and uh, shout out to the, the Ontario teachers Facebook page, they really helped me uh, to to come up with some um, more locations within Canada that I could add to this. And I, in the end, I think I had almost 30 videos recorded. So what I did was I would pick a picture that fit with the historical moment. So for example, one of them was Green Gables and I would uh, use Zoom to record it. Now, like, like I said, in my board, we were using Google Meets. I would simply just record in Zoom because it was easier because I could superimpose the background behind me. Um, and so for something like Green Gables, I would just make sure that there was no signage uh, in Green Gables. And so in particular, the picture I was using for Green Gables, you could actually even see if you were looking at the original photo, it would say like Green Gables, entrance this way or something like that. So I would always make sure that I had positioned my body in front of any signage like that. The John McCray house was also similarly like that. I believe the Dion Quint house was like that as well. So I just kind of made sure that I was covering any signage that um, that might be in front of the house or any defining feature that um, could give the answer without them looking it up. And so what I would do is I would give them a clue and sometimes I'd even wear things. So for example, for the John McCray house, I actually wore a poppy on my shirt to kind of give them a little bit of 
an extra hint for Viola Desmond at Pier 21. I wore a t-shirt that said Halifax. So I was trying to kind of give them little hints. So if they were paying attention to those little details, it would uh, orient them to a particular province or orient them to a, um, uh, the historical event. So for Green Gables, I actually wore a Green Gables t-shirt. Um, and so I would just give a 10, 15 second clue about the location. Sometimes depending on what I was talking about, I would tell them, um, you know, the province. So I might say this isn't located in Ontario or, or located in Manitoba. Um, oftentimes I would just make sure that the image had something that was maybe uh, distinctive. So for example, um, for John M. McGuallick's video, I had the uh, Nunavut legislature and you could see the Nunavut flag in the background. So things like that, that would allow for the students to have some sort of a clue that they could look up. And I would create these videos and I would do them all in one sitting. So I would spend like an hour and I would record, let's say 10 videos in, in an hour. And they're like anywhere between 20 seconds to a minute if, at most. And it would go by really quickly for me to, to record them and I would edit them. And then I would release them on the Monday or Tuesday of that week. And I started to alternate them as we got halfway through distance learning. And so what would happen is I would say, what is this location or who is this person that I'm, that I've given the clue about? And the students would then have to, or not have to, the students could respond to the question by going to D2L and they would uh, jot it into the activity feed that I had set up there for them. And so what I would do is the first person who answered correctly would receive a prize. And what I would send them is vinyl stickers that I bought from Amazon. Now before school closure, I would give vinyl stickers as prizes for various things. Um, so I ended up um, buying more because I had left my container at school. Um, and so I bought some more from Amazon and um, I would mail them a card. The first person from each of the classes who answered correctly would receive a prize. Now I would mail them out a card. So initially I'd gone to Walmart and I bought a pack of 50 cards uh, from them. I think it was like $10, but as distance learning continued, I actually ran out of the cards. So I eventually went to Michael's and I got this pack. Um, and this pack is probably gonna last me a really long time, but this was about $12.99. And I started sending the stickers in this. So yes, I did pay a little bit out of pocket. So I was buying the cards. I bought the stickers and this is, uh, my container from school. Now the Baby Yoda stickers were a big positive. The kids really liked that, but I had kind of a variety and I would just kind of go through them and see which stickers would fit with the personality of the student that I was sending them to. So there's like animals and I have Visco ones and I have, I don't know, just different ones that were in here. And so I'd send them three stickers uh, to put on their laptops or their water bottles. Now, I also, of course, would buy the stamps and I specifically picked Canada Post stamps that had a historical connection. So what I would do is if they won, I would send them a card that would just say, hey, I'm thinking of you, congratulations, here's some stickers, enjoy. And as word started to spread, the competition got a little bit more fierce from what I understand. Um, and, uh, and they were kind of competing and even the kids who had won and I would put in a, um, a little rule of play saying like, if you've already won, please let somebody else have a chance to win. That way there was more diversity of winners. And as soon as it started to kind of slow down a bit, I just reset it. So I um, had students get a chance to win again. In the last day of classes, when we played the last um, of the videos, I allowed anybody to play. And at that point in time, I actually had four winners uh, who all tied at the same time. So I would definitely recommend if you're doing something like this to put rules in place, like um, if you've already won before, you can't win again. Um, the first person to reply is the, the winner, regardless of a tie, things like that. Otherwise, if you have you know four winners, it can get a little bit pricey. Um, but it was the last day of school, so it didn't really bother me as much. But if I was doing that every single day and I was having to deal with ties every single day, then, I would have probably put in more rules about it. The other time that I sent stickers and a card to students was if they had demonstrated leadership. In one of the Flipgrid activities that the students had to do, they had to reflect upon their the leadership that they were experiencing within their collaborative groups. And so I wanted them to kind of highlight any particular student that they felt was going above and beyond um, within their group. And they had to name check that student. And what I decided to do was if a student had been name checked um, more than twice, 
I would send them a card in, uh, as a surprise in the mail. And I, you know, I ha was a little bit hesitant about it, to be honest. Um, but I ended up kind of just doing it because I felt that it was important that they get acknowledged for it. And so I sent them, I think I sent them one or two stickers um, with a card. The card essentially said, you know, uh, your group mates had identified you as demonstrating great leadership. Thank you for your leadership within, um, within your group. Have a, you know, have a great day kind of uh, idea. And uh, the feedback I got from the students who received that was very positive. Some of the students weren't actually individuals who are participating in the game. They just didn't want to participate in it or weren't interested in it. And they were getting these surprise stickers for their collaboration and their leadership. And so they were, re it really made their day and they commented that that much. So I was really glad to have done that. One of the other things that I did through my learn at home um, uh, template is I also included an opportunity for students at the end of a week to respond to a Google form where they wrote in about what they felt they had problems with and what they felt they were, you know, okay with. And so every week they would type in what they had a challenge with. And this worked out really well for my students. It gave me a sense of like the questions that they had with regards to the homework for that week. And interestingly enough, usually the question that they had were um, similar to each other. Like they wouldn't have known that, but they were asking very similar questions to their classmates. And so that really showed me where there was some gaps in knowledge or gaps in understanding. And so when we did meet as a class, I would then go through those questions. And it allowed me to have kind of the foundation of what I could talk about at our Google Meets. And so I would review the previous week's work by answering their questions. I would also look at their submissions in D2L just to see if there was any um, learning gaps that were happening or questions I felt weren't correctly answered and I would address those in our weekly Google Meets. At the end of the semester students did say that they really appreciated us meeting together as a class in the Google Meet and um, and they really appreciated me going through those questions that they had. They felt it helped clarify the questions that they had experienced in trying to complete the homework. One thing that I'm really glad that I did is I started to add a leave a message for Miss Yorio at the bottom of the, that same form. Now this is a little bit self-serving. Um, what was starting to happen is I was starting to feel a little, um, you know, sad. Like, you know, here I am doing all this work and I'm not getting any feedback about whether or not they even like what I'm doing. Um, and so I decided to add in this box at the bottom that was that was basically like, leave a message for me. And so the message ranged from like, have a great day, I hope you're healthy, kind of, you know, very, um, you know, ge generic to, you know, can you please do this? Or I really appreciate when you do that. Um, and that at times really helped kind of motivate me to continue forward with what I was doing. And so when they would say things like, thank you so much for the stickers, or um, I really appreciate the video and the effort that you put in, um, it really kind of helped me and, you know, filled my heart a little bit. And I needed that, you know, like we are also uh, very isolated during distance learning. And so just even hearing positive feedback from my students just really lifted me up. And so putting in that box to, to give them a chance to give me feedback, even sometimes it wasn't always positive or um, sometimes it was like, you know, I'm really struggling with this, um, it still gave me insight into what was happening in my class. And so it gave them a voice um, when maybe they didn't have another opportunity to offer up that voice. Let's talk a little bit about these Google Meets. So I mentioned that that the Google Meet in, um, in itself was a good idea, that meeting with the students was a good idea. Now let's talk about the problem with that. Um, Google Meets is very limited in what it can offer. And this was very problematic. I would have loved to have students break out into smaller groups. And in fact, I tried to do that. Um, so my students were working collaboratively to do a digital escape game, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and they had, I wanted them to meet with their groups. And so during our one hour um, time together, I would tell them, okay, go into this Google Meet and a separate Google Meet, and I want you to talk to your group members. And so on my computer, I would have five tabs open across my browser. And in each of the five tabs was one group. So the 1960s was meeting in tab one, tab two was the 70s, uh, tab three, the 80s and onward. And for them on the student end, they could hear each other no problem and were engaging in conversation. And the, the feedback from that was very positive. For me as the teacher, however, I was hearing 25, 30 voices all at one time. And so I was not hearing anything, if you can imagine. So it's like having, you know, 30 students all yelling in your ear at the same time. 
just wasn't conducive to learning at all for me. Like I couldn't troubleshoot for them. I couldn't answer questions. I couldn't intervene if anything was to happen. Um, and so that was really problematic. What I ended up doing was downloading some various extensions like tab, um, mute tab, uh, to try and control that. And so what I would do is I would mute the tab and then go into one tab, listen for a couple of minutes, move into the next tab and so on and troubleshoot. And eventually got to the point where I was just saying, if you have questions, put them into the chat box and I'll, when I pop in, I'll check the chat box. What ended up happening was, and this is strictly from Google, um, is the tabs could not handle the sound or something that happened. Um, and Google couldn't ha handle or Chrome couldn't handle the five tabs open at once or the four tabs. And even honestly, I would have as low as like two tabs where one tab was talking and one tab wasn't talking. It didn't matter. If I had multiple tabs of Google Meet open, it crashed. Um, and not that the tabs themselves crashed, what ended up happening is the sound crashed. So they were talking, they could hear me, but I couldn't hear anything that they were saying. And it was really, um, I don't want to say scary, but it was really alarming um, to not be able to hear anything that they were saying. So I had no idea what was going on and there was nothing I could do. And even refreshing the browser, closing and coming back into the room did nothing to solve it. It was, it was just like, you know, Google said, you're not allowed to do this. Um, and it happened several times. It didn't matter if I had five groups or one group or five groups or two tabs, um, two groups, it crashed on me. The eventual workaround to this was that I was expected to use Firefox or I was asked to use Firefox to use Google Meets. And so I would uh, use the browser of Firefox um, and I could have the multiple tabs open and that seemed to work. Again, why should I have to go through all these hoops just to have students bre do breakout uh, discussions? It was just an added hurdle um, and uh, quite frankly, unreasonable. And it was just a limitation to Google and there was nothing I could do about it. Since we're talking about Google Meet, and the problems with it, um, I will also mention the problem with the Google Grid view. So Google Grid is amazing for you to be able to see all your students kind of together on, um, on a grid. And this is really helpful because it almost feels like you're in a classroom seeing all your students in front of you. The Google uh, Grid extension was unstable. They would keep updating and I understand that, you know, they've seen an, an uptick in people using their, their extension and that they're not gonna be ready for it totally understand that and I'm forgiving of that. The problem was is that they would update and when they would update, it would crash. So it wasn't always working. And, um, you know, when I wanted to take a class photo of us, I wasn't even sure if it was going to work. So, you know, there were these kinds of uh, hurdles created by some of the extensions. So if these were all built into Google uh, and Google Meets, that would have been, you know, eased all of that trouble. Um, I'm told, however, that you know, Google is working on an update and a fix for all of these problems and are starting to try and make themselves more Zoom-like, um, but wasn't soon enough, as, if I'm being honest. The next thing that I felt was really successful was how I had the students submit their work on a, on a weekly basis. So because, like I mentioned, I was having the students go to the Learn at Home website. What I would ask the students to do is to submit all of their work. So anything, any of the shoulds, so all of the shoulds would need to be submitted to D2L. Now D2L or Brightspace is what is ministry funded in the province of Ontario. So this may not be true of your case, but it could be applied to something like Canvas or another learning uh, platform that you might use. So what the students would do is whatever work that was in the shoulds, would they would submit it to D2L. At the end of a week, and it started being, my intention was I was gonna do it on a Friday, and it turned out that some students were actually working on the homework on Saturday or Friday or what have you, and they were kind of missing that um, time between me checking on Friday and then class on Monday. So I started moving it to just Sunday mid uh, afternoon uh, when I would check it. And what I would do is I would look to see if they had completed all the work. Now, how did I go about checking this off? I used Google Forms and I got this template from Google Forms from uh, Pocketful of Primary. She had talked about it in, I believe it was one of her YouTube videos. If not, then it was definitely on Instagram. Um, and she offered up the template for people to download. And I took her up on that offer and I was very grateful for doing it. But um, basically I would input all of the student names on the left column. And then um, I actually modified 
uh, Michelle's original template to be more reflective of what I was expecting the students to do. So hers was more targeted for elementary. Um, mine, of course, was going to be targeted for high schoolers. So what I did was I would do week of, so week of June, whatever, and I would write in the activities that they were expected to hand in. So all of the shoulds. And then I would check in D2L to see, did they hand it in? So um, Christina handed in the Cold War activity, check. Uh, she did not hand in um, post-war world. So I left that blank. So this spreadsheet allowed me to have data in a very visible way. And the bonus was that I could actually have the tabs along the bottom and I could flip between the different sections I had in the different months. And in order for me to record the students' accomplishments is I would just freeze the left column um, so that their names didn't move, but the, the other columns would, would move and I could kind of slide them back and forth. And then I would use tab scissors and tab glue. So tab scissors is a Chrome extension that allows you to have the two uh, windows side by side. And so I could see D2L on the one side and then the form on the, the other side. And I would just check off as I scroll downward um, between the two columns. The next thing I want to talk about is how I changed up the way that I did my video lectures. Now for history teachers, the easiest way to do a video lecture is to just do a screencast where you uh, move through a slideshow and maybe you have yourself in the, the corner of the, the screencast and you uh, lecture to your students. The students in my class seem to enjoy this, but I decided to kind of change it up a little bit. Now I have in the past um, presented at conferences at my board uh, about using YouTube in the classroom and taking YouTuber strategy and applying it to instruction. And I decided to kind of put my money where my mouth was or, you know, my YouTuber knowledge to, to, to work. And I just changed up the way that I presented my videos. So what I ended up doing, and I, I'll link the Twitter thread that I wrote about this um, in the description box, but essentially I just changed up the formatting of how I went about presenting my content. So I did a film noir to talk about the Canadian caper. I did a time traveling uh, version to take them throughout the French English relations. Um, so things like this where I'm just doing more of a creative way. The one that seemed to be the most popular of all the videos was the unboxing. For when I would present at these conferences, I would always talk about the unboxing as being something that a language teacher could use. Um, so in, a, in an unboxing, you can, there's tons of unboxings on YouTube that you can look at. But in an unboxing, a person, you know, opens up a box of that they've received in the mail and they talk about the things that are within it. So if it's makeup or shoes or whatever, and they talk about the textures and things like that. So in my head, how this would work for a languages class is now they're using descriptive language to talk about what's in the box. So in a French class, the student could open up a box that was populated by another student and they could uh, use their language skills to describe this. Um, so that was what was in my head. What I ended up doing is changing it up a little bit. Um, in uh, my regular class, I would do what was what I called an antiques roadshow. So I would take antiques like the typewriter you see behind me, and I would put them in different stations. So I have a station for the 50s and onward, and the students get to kind of do hands-on um, play with these various items. So they got to experience live antiques in person. And they couldn't do this now because we're not in the same location. So what I decided to do was to take a historical piece of luggage, a piece of luggage that I bought at an antiques um, store, and I put in antiques from the 1960s. So some of them were like legitimate antiques, like I have a catalog from the 1960s, I have a passport from Expo 67, and others were like, well, here's a Canada flag. Um, and what I did was I used the principles of an unboxing where I opened the luggage and I uh, pulled out each of the items. And as I pulled out the items, I talked about their historical significance to Canadian history. And the kids really thought that that was an interesting and innovative way to go about describing history um, and to lecture because ultimately it was a lecture, but it was a different kind of lecture. And it gave them an, uh, a way to see those antiques without actually having them in person. And the feedback at the end of the semester was like, that was their like, favorite um, lesson of the whole course and their favorite activity of the whole course. And ultimately it wasn't even an activity, it was just a lecture, like an introduction to a greater lesson. So um, now you don't need antiques to do that. You could just as easily do an unboxing with photographs. So you could print out 
pictures from the internet. You could use terms or words and pull them out and still talk. And it's just an interesting and new way to do it. And you don't, and I use a piece of luggage, but you could use a shoebox or whatever you want to do. So it's really is versatile and can be applied to many different subjects. In line with using the creative video formats, I also did creative types of activities. So the easiest thing to do is question and answer. And quite frankly, I did lean into that a lot where I would pull from resources like the CBC Digital Archives or Canadian Encyclopedia or NFB and I would have them watch videos or read um, encyclopedia entries and then answer questions for that. Very straightforward and allowed them, an op you know, it allowed me this opportunity to use resources that are out there because they didn't have textbooks. They didn't have access to textbooks. So, well, half the class didn't have access to textbooks. So this um, was a way to kind of facilitate their learning without, you know, leaning into a textbook. In the feedback that I was getting from the students, they were uh, demonstrating that they were getting a little bit bored or tired of the question and answer format. So I needed to change that up. And what I decided to do was just kind of create a more interesting way to get those critical thinking skills across. So what I would do is I would deploy um, some of the strategies that I may have used in a regular classroom. So things like who's coming to dinner. So for French English relations in my class, the students would have these images of the various individuals from French English relations history, and they would have to decide who's going to be sitting next to each other. So will you put um, Pierre Trudeau next to um, Rene Levesque? Why or why not? Right. And this is like this who's coming to dinner activity is done by a lot of people. I digitized it. So I had them do this in um, either Google Drawings or Google Slides, and then they had to explain to me why. So they're still accomplishing what I would have essentially asked them to accomplish in a Q&A, but now they're doing it um, digitally. And so um, that's one example. Uh, History Gal on TPT has emergency subplans that for a history class that have some cool ideas. And I took some of those ideas and I kind of adapted them for my situation. So for the Canadian caper, I had them um, decide who would they um, hire to be on the film. So it's still getting the end result where they're still having to explain to me the events of the Canadian caper and what went ha what happened, but they're now transcribing it in a new way, in a kind of a creative way. And one of the feedback, uh, feedback messages I got from the students was that it actually made them think more critically and it was a little bit more challenging, but challenging in a fun way. One of the things that my students really raved about at their end of semester uh, reflections was the escape game. Now, in regular class, I would have the students work together to do an escape game. So they would get boxes with locks on it. They would create an escape game that they would um, uh, perform, for lack of a better term, uh, in the library. And they would have other teams play their game and experience that. Obviously, I couldn't do a lockbox and a um, game with the students in distance learning. And I was really struggling to figure out how am I going to do an escape game? How am I going to do this? It's a CPT for my students. How am I going to be able to do this um, at distance learning? Because I felt it was a really valuable uh, group work opportunity. And like, you know, um, angels from heaven, uh, the hip story teacher on Instagram, I follow her also on Twitter. Uh, she posted about a Harry Potter um, escape game that was using Google Forms. And I played, you know, like a fraction of the game and it kind of inspired me. It was very simplistic. Like it was meant for middle schoolers in terms of its difficulty level, but it was achievable. And it was something I could now use as an example for my students. You can do an escape game using Google Forms. Here's an example for you because I just didn't have an example that I could show them of, of an escape game and creating one yourself is time consuming. I've created escape games myself. They take forever. Um, and so I just didn't have the time to create one myself. And here was this escape game for middle schoolers available for me to show and use as an example. So it really kind of open the floodgates for me to be able to use as, um, you know, a template for students to say, this is what it could look like now create one based on your decade. And so I gave them the option. So within their groups, they were already before uh, closure placed into groups that uh, reflected a particular decade and they'd already done the pre-work. So they'd already researched their decade. And I gave them the option of doing either choose your own adventure using Google forms or, or sorry, using uh, Google slides or doing an escape game using Google Forms, or they could marry the two and, and do a combination. So the students themselves and their groups decided they were going to do choose your own adventure or were they going to do um, an escape game. 
And I would meet with them um, on my own time, to be honest, uh, in a Google Meet to allow them to work together as a group. I would probably organize that a little bit differently, um, but we were on a time crunch and I made sacrifices in order to do this. But they met on their own time to talk on Google Meets. Um, they uh, engaged with each other in other uh, formats, so using Google Chat, um, email, whatever the case that might be is, and they built an escape game or they built a choose your own adventure game. And they were incredible. Um, and at the end, when they submitted their game, I had them play each other's games. So each decade had to play two other decades and um, and then provide feedback. And in that feedback, they had to explain where they saw historical thinking skills within the game. So of course, in the, the creation of the game, the creators had to employ the use of the historical thinking skills that we had been practicing all semester and had to employ that in the game itself. The student playing the game had to say where they saw the, the historical skills. The, they then wrote a feedback uh, in a feedback form, which was a Google form that I just created. Um, and the spreadsheet that I have with data that shows how they perceived the historical skills is just invaluable. They learned so much just by playing another group member's game. And the feedback at the end of the semester was so positive about this. For starters, they loved, you know, talking to their classmates and being able to work as a group, which I thought they weren't going to enjoy being at a distance, but they actually felt that it was challenging enough, but, but at the same time, easy enough that they could overcome that. Um, so they enjoyed working with other group members. They enjoyed playing each other's games and they enjoyed reflecting upon uh, the work. And so it's not an essay that I was asking them to do for their CPT. It was instead a reflection on how did I apply historical skills? How, what went wrong in the collaborative experience? And, you know, from a teacher standpoint, that was very easy for me to evaluate. And for a student point, uh, standpoint, it was not particularly onerous. So it gave them an opportunity to illustrate those historical skills, work with their group members, work with their classmates, and do something that was fun and play something that was fun. And that was their feedback at the end of the semester that they felt that whole experience was invaluable and so important, especially at a time when they couldn't even see their friends and they couldn't hang out with their friends. So that's definitely something I would do again. And it really um, showed me that that I can kind of push my understanding of how an assignment is is developed in a distance learning capacity. And that's basically the things that went well for me in distance learning and the things that eh, didn't go so well for me in distance learning. Please know that these are just ideas. If you have any other suggestions that went, of things that went well for you, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. Uh, but just know that you put in a ton of work for distance learning. It was not easy and you should be proud of yourself and give yourself a nice pat on the back because genuinely it was challenging for not only students, but for teachers as well. Thank you so much for all the support that you guys have shown me on my Instagram and on my Twitter. And if you'd like to follow me and aren't following me already, I'll put my handles up in the corner here. Um, thank you. And I hope to see you guys soon. Bye.